Hello and welcome AP Stat students to our last chapter, chapter 12, more about regression. We're going to spend a couple days, in fact three days here on 12.1 on inference for linear regression. So after the section we should be able to check the conditions. We're going to check the conditions. Uh, that's again our second box uh, in our uh, state plan do and conclude uh, procedures for performing inference. Uh, we're going to be looking at the conditions for making inferences about the slope beta of a population regression line or a true regression line. We're going to interpret the values of A, which is our constant, or B, which is our slope, or S, uh, which is our standard deviation of our residuals. This is the standard error of our slopes. And this is our coefficient of determination. We'll determine these values from our computer output. So again, here we'll be looking at our TI Inspire calculator outputs. And we'll do that as well to help us construct and interpret confidence intervals for the slope, and also do significant tests about the slope. All right. So when a scatter plot shows a linear relationship between a quantitative explanatory variable x, so again, those will be our x values here, and a quantitative response variable y. Or we can use the least squares line fitted to the data to predict y for a given value of x. And again, we plot data, and you find that line of best fit, and we can use that line, uh, this line y equals a plus bx, to help us predict values. So if I've got a certain x value down here, I can use that line to predict what my y value is. So if the data are a random sample from a larger population, we need statistical inference to answer questions like these. Is there really a linear relationship between X and Y in the population? You know, this is my sample. Is that uh, you know, truly uh, a linear relationship, or did I happen to just get that by chance? In the population, how much will the predicted value of Y change for each increase one unit of X? So basically what we're doing here is we're just looking at slope looking at how things change, you know, your rise over your run or your change in the y over the change in the x. And then we'll look at the margin of error for that estimate. So uh, we'll be looking at that, uh, well, part of that calculation will involve the standard error of the slope. So below is a scatter plot of the duration and interval of time until the next eruption of Old Faithful uh, for all the 222 recorded eruptions in a single month. The least squared regression line for this population has been added to this graph. We call this the population regression line, or the true regression line, because we, these are all the data points, uh, the 222 data points for that month. So we've got all the data. So we can then accurately calculate a regression line for that data, and there it is. But let's suppose we take an SRS of 20 eruptions from the population and calculate the least squared regression line for R20, and we'll have some Y hat, that's our sample Y hat, or our predicted Y uh, value based off of our sample data. Um, so how does the slope of the sample regression line, so the slope right here, how does the slope of that regression line relate to the slope of the population regression line? So how does that uh, relate to what that is? Okay. And we usually denote the population, the slope, the slope of the population regression line as the Greek letter beta. So the figures below show the results of taking three different SRSs of 20 old faithful eruptions in this month. Each graph displays the selected points and the least squared regression line for that sample. So again, we take the sample of 20 from that population of 222. We got our line here, and that's the regression line for this one. Uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So we took a sample size of 20 from this one, came up with our regression line uh, for this graph, and again took a sample size of 20 and got a regression line for this graph up here. And you know what we notice is that these uh, the slopes of these sample regression lines, here it's 10.2, here it's 7.7, here it's 9.5, they vary quite a bit from what uh, the previous slide, our population regression line of 10.36. Let's bring it back and take a look at that. So we had 10.36 was our population. So they vary quite a bit from that, which we would expect in samples. Uh, that's what happens. But if we were to take many, 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 many uh, of these Bs, 
many, many, many of those bees, you know, from, um, let's say 1,000, you got a thousand different uh, people that did uh, sample sizes of 20, um, and we plotted it all out here. Okay, now what we can start to see is we can start to look at the shape of this distribution. And we can see the distribution of the B values is roughly symmetric and unimodal. Now we should get most of our, most people should get it close to what the true one is, though we do get some people that will be off a little bit, uh, but not very many. So that's why we get the normal, normalish looking curve here. The center uh, should be right about, uh, if we take many, many of these, should be very, very close to what that true population slope was. And uh, in this example, they actually got 10.35, um, and the true one is 10.36. So that's a pretty darn good ex uh, uh, estimate. Um, they're getting very close as we take more and more. If we want to get more accurate, obviously we take more. Then our spread, the standard deviation of these 1,000 B values is 1.29. We just call that our S value. Um, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of B is actually 1.27, so again, you see we took a thousand values. We're going to get pretty close the more and more we take. So, kind of let's look at uh, what's being done here for a sampling distribution of a slope. You know, so what you do is you choose an SRS of n observations. In that last example, we were, we were taking 20 observations from a population size n. I don't think there's, that was 222. Uh, and we'll get a least squares regression line. We get our value here. Uh, we notice then that this beta value, uh, that's actually what we do is we actually uh, find that mean, uh, that mean slope. So we can see that uh, we got that B value by finding the mean of all of our little b's to estimate that slope. Right. Standard deviation of the sampling distribution of B is, is the following. Uh, don't worry too much about this because we'll be using technology uh, to help us get these values anyway. But just got to remember that when we do our conditions, uh, in order to use this standard deviation formula, we have to satisfy that 10% condition. And again, the sampling distribution should be able to be approximately normal if the values of the response variable y follow a normal distribution for each value of the explanatory variable x. Okay. So again, that sampling distribution, as we looked back before, um, will be approximately normal uh, the more and more we take, as we see. Okay, so conditions for the regression inference. The regression model requires that for each possible value of the explanatory variable x, that the mean value of the response variable, mean of the y's, falls on the population regression line. So when we take uh, each of our different values of x, uh, they'll follow what that population, so people may have different uh, samples as they go through, uh, but each value of that x uh, uh, for each value of that x, the mean value, the mean y value, would fall on our regression line. The value of the response variable y follow a normal distribution with common standard deviation uh, of, of sigma. So, uh, so each of the individual values of the response value, well, you know, will have a little bit of a spread, a little bit of a spread on each of those. But again, that mean should follow right on our predicted regression line. So let's look at some of those conditions for regression inference. Uh, so we're kind of looking at our second box eventually when we get into our um, significance testing or confidence intervals. So, so suppose we have n observations on an explanatory real x and a response real y. Our goal is to study or predict the behavior for y for given values of x. So we're not looking at the sin or the psi. I've got another uh, mnemonic device here to help you remember what we do for conditions for regression inference. So we'll see that in a second. First I have to show uh, linear, that the actual relation between x and y is linear. And for any fixed value of x, the mean response of, of the y's falls on the population regression line. So we're going to end up making a little graph for that. Also got to check for independence. Uh, you're always safe just checking that 10% condition. In other words, that 10 times your sample size uh, is less than or equal to your population. 
Now we're going to check for normality. Okay, when we check for normality, uh, we're going to look for any fixed value of x that the response of y varies according to a normal distribution. So we're going to be looking at uh, our residuals. Uh, do our residuals form a normal distribution? We'll be looking at uh, equal standard deviation. So the standard deviation of y, uh, so the, the standard deviation of all the response variables, which we'll call sigma, is the same for all x values. Well, in other words, what we're going to do here is we're going to be looking at a residual plot because those are the, uh, all the differences in the in the y's uh, between our predicted and our observed uh, for a given x. We're going to be looking at a, re a residual plot. And what we're going to be looking at is simply that uh, as we look at a residual plot that there isn't, you know, a, a, a big difference as we go along. Some of the problems that we'll have is if you have a residual plot and you can see that it's doing something like this and then it kind of gets tighter. The bigger the x's get bigger, the standard deviation, the residuals get smaller. That would be a problem. Maybe we wouldn't have an equal standard deviation as as we progress along the line. I think it would be a slight variation, but we're kind of looking at, you know, is there a general pattern or general um, uh, distance from that line rather than as we go along if it kind of tapers um, or you know for the or vice versa goes the other way around and then we got to look at randomness now we just put this last kind of for um, uh, the ability to use a uh, mnemonic device here but again our data should always come from a well-designed random sample and uh, without that make sure that we at least have a randomized experiment so what we can do is to help us remember that second box we got a new mnemonic device we got L I N E R, can kind of look at that as liner or liner. Um, and it also kind of helps us remember that if we're doing regression analysis for regression inference, um, you know, we're doing linear regression, so it might help us remember uh, that we got to do the liner part. Okay. So, how do we check all these conditions? We'll start by making a histogram or a normal probability plot of the residuals. So again, a histogram of the residuals or a normal probability plot of the residuals. Um, and uh, we also make a residual plot as well too. Uh, that would be very helpful. So in the linear part of our liner, you examine the scatter plot to check that the overall pattern is roughly linear. Uh, so when you make take your original data, make a, like a, make a scatter plot, Look to see this, does linear make sense? So, you know, looking for curved patterns. Um, and then also check to see that the residuals center on the, the zero line at each value for the residuals. In other words, in our residual plot, uh, that they are centered, you know, right along that zero line right there. Independence. Look at all the data are produced. Random sampling and random assignment help ensure the independence of individual observations. But if sampling wasn't done, is done without replacement, check that 10% condition. Again, that 10 times n is less than or equal to our population. Normal, we're going to make a uh, stem plot or a histogram, probably suggest a histogram, or you can use that normal probability plot, um, but make sure you do it of the residuals um, and look for clear skewness or other major departures, in other words, outliers uh, from normality. Equal standard deviation, I kind of talked about in the last slide. Again, look at the scatter of the residuals above and below the residual line. Uh, the vertical spread of the residuals should be roughly, roughly the same from the smallest to the largest x value. So again, as we're looking at a residual plot, that you know that the that they're all about the same distance away. And lastly, again, make sure the data are produced by a random sampling or a randomized experiment. Okay. At this point. Uh, you should now be able to uh, do these problems here from day one, problems numbers one and three. All right. Uh, good luck, and we'll see you in the day two video.